Bir, bir. Gelir. Ha, yaxşı.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, attending the uh, open forum of UNESCO. We uh, are very glad to uh, have you with us today. The idea of uh, uh, today's forum is to present the um, uh, upcoming VSIS Plus 10 review conference, uh, which will take place uh, in Paris uh, end of February next year and uh, uh, try to explain the prep preparation, uh, preparatory process to this uh, event as well as uh, our expectations uh, from different partners. Uh, we have prepared a, a slide presentation and um, uh, Cedric uh, Vashholtz, who is um, uh, a chief organizing officer of this uh, conference, if I may say, uh, will uh, make this presentation. Uh, with us today is also Guy Berger, the uh, director of the Freedom Expression and Media Development Division uh, of UNESCO, and uh, everything related to uh, freedom, in, uh, freedom expression, uh, 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 privacy, uh, media development uh, should be geared towards, towards him. Myself, I am Janis Karklinch, Assistant Director General of UNESCO, uh, in charge of communications and information. And um, uh, if we will have time uh, at the second part of the meeting, I will brief you on uh, our work related to uh, preservation of digital heritage, uh, namely the uh, uh, outcome of the conference uh, memory of the world in the digital age, digitization and preservation, which took place in Vancouver at the end of September this year, as well as uh, uh, the work we're doing on uh, multilingualism. Uh, maybe you have heard about already, uh, we just launched a, a world report on ID and uptake uh, report, which was uh, uh, developed together with URID, .eu registry. So this is the plan. Uh, we uh, we do not uh, want to uh, give just one-way information. We would be happy to answer questions. Uh, and without uh, further delay, if Cedric is ready, I will uh, ask Cedric to walk us through uh, the presentation on uh, VSIS Plus 10 Review uh, Conference. Thank you very much, Yanis, uh, for um, giving us the opportunity and the opportunity to present what UNESCO and uh, also U ITU, UNDP, and UNCTAD are preparing for the WISIS Plus 10 review. Here you see um, this is an important uh, opportunity for all. Do you have also this on sound in the, or is it only my headphones? So uh, it is uh, particularly relevant also for those attending uh, the IGF, um, not only because the IGF was born out of WISIS, and, uh, but also because we will hold a special uh, internet event at this WISIS Plus 10 review, um, concentrating on uh, UNESCO-specific internet topics. But I will uh, briefly, for those, I see there are a few younger people in the audience too who did not necessarily attend with 2003 and five, um, give them also an ov overview of the process, uh, which will start uh, the WISIS plus 10 review process with a first conference hosted by UNESCO from 25th to 27th February 2013 in UNESCO Paris. Um, and uh, there will be another conference uh, in 2014 uh, hosted by ITU in Egypt, and uh, there will be the final UNGA review event in 2015. Um, the different elements of this uh, review process are 
that the emphasis in the 2013 event will be actually uh, on, an, uh, on recent and future developments. That means it has a clear forward-looking uh, dimension. Um, the 2013 event. We will have recommendations who will uh, come out of that and contribute into the MDG and with this review and also to the post-2015 agenda. One needs to say uh, on that point also that there are, uh, the upcoming week actually, there will be a continued discussion in New York uh, about this WISIS plus 10 review, about the WISIS review modalities and we might adapt the schemes to the decisions of member states uh, at the UNGA. Uh, but UNESCO has anyway a general conference decision by 195 member states which asked us to hold such an event. So independently of this, uh, this precise outcomes, we will go forward with this February event in 2013. In 2014, I mean, with a focus on this forward-looking dimension. Um, in 2014, ITU will host the WISIS review and there we will uh, really look at the details of the 2003 formulated objectives in 2005 and how far we went and review in all details all different action lines. And uh, we will there also adopt the forward-looking outcome. Um, the, and there will be a final uh, UNGA uh, event in 2015 contributing to the MDG review process. Um, all this plan has been developed in six different phases with all multi, I mean, with all stakeholders uh, by a um, process led by ANGUS, the United Nations Group on the Information Society. And this is the, the action plan I'm describing here. And again, it might change uh, with decisions in New York. The unifying, um, the upcoming weeks. Uh, the unifying theme is uh, towards knowledge societies for peace and sustainable development. And uh, those who know the Geneva Declaration of Principles by heart, it actually ends with the phrase, we trust that these measures, all the principles described in Geneva uh, Declaration of Principles in 2003, we trust that these measures will open the way to the future development of a true knowledge society. So we will look uh, also in 2013, in February, so 10 years after Geneva, how far we have gone in this vision of meeting the vision of knowledge societies. And uh, here you see uh, the knowledge society topic is mo often associated with the world report UNESCO produced in 2005 towards knowledge societies. But if you look and search, you can find that in 1998, actually it was also a UNCSTD report uh, published on that. So it's a broader theme. Uh, and, and all co-organizers agreed happily on this overall theme. So it is organized, co-organized with ITU, UNDP, and UNCTAD. All stakeholders are involved and invited, and uh, key actors are invited to co-organize meetings on their themes, and, build, and it is a building block approach, uh, meaning that UNESCO will offer across uh, the themes of its mandate um, like a backbone of this event, but we invite other stakeholders, of course, to also address uh, their related themes. Um, here I will go rapidly through the three days and uh, will highlight then afterwards uh, the internet dimension of this. On Monday, uh, the three days can be structured that on the first day we will look at recent developments, meaning that while this is a forward-looking uh, uh, conference and the emphasis is on the future and on post-2015 uh, dimension, we will look also at recent development and recent trends because uh, mobile phones, for example, were not even mentioned in the WISIS outcomes. And there are many different, I mean, so Facebook was founded only in 2004 and so on. So there are many important developments which are not necessarily reflected uh, in the documents, but uh, which are important for looking f for f uh, into the future. The second day has the, um, or I will just say also that um, we expect, uh, or we have conf as a confirmed speaker here for, uh, for the first day, Jeffrey Sachs, um, who will, uh, we have, uh, we intend to have really high uh, level, high, uh, very respected speakers. And he will present actually a report on ICTs and education, including with a particular emphasis also on broadband. Again, looking forward uh, is the, the emphasis of this event. Uh, and the Broadband Commission for Education 
uh, we'll have an, an open meeting and discussing also the this broadband commission report it will be followed by a high level round table and uh, yes on the on the s on the afternoon we intend or we will look at recent developments and the challenges across different uh, action lines and activities so here we will look at the last uh, years but we also want to to assess some of the challenges uh, in terms of the different themes we are addressing. And the second day, we will um, actually do not, will not break up in the traditional WISIS action lines, but will uh, look again at different themes, uh, analyze recent developments, look at foresight in these, and at different recommendations to be formulated across different themes like e-learning or access to knowledge and information, e-science, uh, cultural diversity and so on um, and and here we have also we will have the UNESCO special internet event uh, plus a lot of other events and on the third day uh, and I will say a few more day, uh, words on the UNESCO special event on the third day we will really look at the post 2015 of knowledge societies and recommendations we intend to to have a future forum with about 100 people, we will go out in different breakup sessions, come together and so on to, to s discuss a different uh, a vision of future knowledge societies and co-create it with all participants. And, uh, and in parallel, we will also finalize the, dr the recommendations which we want to, to come out of this uh, conference to be adopted at the end of the day. Now, um, for, for uh, particularly important for those participants here also, on, on the following Thursday and Friday, so February 28th and 1st March, the Internet Governance Forum prep meetings will take place in UNESCO Paris, meaning the open consultations and the MAC meeting will just follow on Thursday and Friday. Uh, so, so it's of particular interest and you can well combine uh, then, then the both uh, conferences, um, or both events. Uh, so UNESCO special internet event uh, will will focus on the post 2015 future of the internet along the themes uh, which UNESCO stands for the multilingualism the freedom of expression the long content creation and also the ethical dimension of knowledge societies and you have seen and perhaps participated in some of the I mean uh, the internet privacy and freedom of expression publications a global survey was launched here we brought some 200 copies but they're unfortunately all gone uh, now and there are other publications the Europe UNESCO world report on internationalized domain names which on which we would like to build during this event uh, and there are many more I just took a few publications uh, but we will also have actually we have commissioned some forward more forward-looking research which we intend to discuss also in the preparation of this conference but also afterwards um, so just uh, how how does it relate to you and your work uh, depending of course if you're more uh, you know attending here from private uh, sector uh, um, or coming from an from an international organization or government you could uh, invite your uh, secretary general your CEO to attend one of the high level uh, I mean parts of this event which are mainly the high level round table and and yourself you could participate in the brainstorming on the the recent and uh, developments and challenges across business action lines and activities and state your organizational views and here uh, for the second day of course ensure your theme be present and your views be represented in the thematic meetings but also of course in the internet special event uh, think about future developments and also related recommendations and also on, on day three learn and contribute share your views in all these different dimensions including on the recommendations or the, the development of the vision and of course uh, you should participate in the open consultations and the MAC meetings the, you know the following two days too um, just to say that there is an uh, this entire process uh, has been initiated al already last year with the Angus uh, consultations and development um, the action plan which was developed but we had a face-to-face -face consultation on this event 
in May at the WISIS Forum 2012. But also, if you look at the WISIScommunity.org, you will find online discussions about uh, what should the format be, what should be the process uh, for this event. Uh, and now, in the next week, we will open um, uh, the possibility for proposal of sessions and also the request for exhibition stands. So it becomes now really concrete following you know, some online discussions we had already before in the WISIS community. Uh, and, and you're invited to propose and submit your proposals now. We have also developed on this WISIS community an inclusive editing uh, uh, or a feature which allows us for an inclusive editing process. We will put up some of the research we've specially produced for this event uh, here online on this WISIS community. And here you can see, I don't know to which extent, but uh, people will be able to either edit or comment on different uh, parts and then other users can rate the different comments with stars and so on. So that's a very new feature, but it's important for us uh, in the preparation of this 2013 event that it's inclusive, that everyone can contribute in the build-up, including on the, on the reports we will produce. And that's a very inclusive uh, uh, process we are, we are allowing to happen here. Just for the schedule, um, the, we had uh, now the c uh, consultation on the events approach, thematic forward, uh, focus and format. And uh, format. And next week we'll, we'll, as I mentioned, start with the expression of interest in organizing meetings and exhibition stands. It will be followed to, uh, with online consultations on recommendations and research outcomes. And which is a little bit less good visible, of course, the multi-stakeholder event uh, from 25th to 27th February um, organized, co-organized with ITU, UNCTAD and UNDP and hosted by UNESCO, um, followed by the IGF open consultations and MAC, uh, MAC meetings on 28th February. And if you're an UNGIS member, we will also have a working level group meeting um, on 28th uh, February. So this was just a rapid overview of the overall process, the theme, the different the structure, uh, the different tools we're using to prepare uh, the process, but also the, um, the outcome of the, of the uh, conference and the schedule. Uh, and with uh, you know, particular words also on the internet special event. So I hope that was a, an introductory remarks which help you understand the framework of this event. Thank you, Cedric, for uh, this uh, presentation. <coughs> what I would like to add is the following. Uh, this is not UNESCO event. This is a multi-stakeholder event, uh, which we are uh, willing to organize uh, together with uh, all interested uh, uh, stakeholder groups. Uh, UNESCO will ensure the backbone of the meeting and we will concentrate uh, on the first day uh, to core activities of UNESCO, namely uh, education. Uh, but that does not exclude uh, that any other event could be added uh, in, that, uh, in that day. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the call for proposals will go out next week, as, as you heard from Cedric. The second day uh, will be, the backbone of the second day will be um, uh, UNESCO Internet Special Event. And again, uh, we, we hope that uh, interested stakeholder groups will come up with the proposals in organizing uh, their, uh, their own uh, sort of events uh, which would contribute to the, to the um, discussion. Uh, UNESCO will suggest uh, the backbone uh, of the um, uh, of this stream uh, and all the rest will be added uh, to, the, to the event. The same goes for the third day. We have reserved 17 parallel, uh, we have reserved actually the, the whole UNESCO building is reserved for, for, for uh, the whole week uh, for this event. We can accommodate 17 parallel meetings. Of course, we're uh, uh, realistic and uh, we understand that there will not be 17 parallel, but this is as uh, how far we can go. Uh, whether that is two, three, five, ten parallel, doesn't matter. Uh, the rooms uh, which uh, are available uh, goes from uh, 15, no, uh, 
200, uh, 2,500, the biggest one, then uh, about 1,000, and then smaller rooms, uh, 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 and then uh, the, the smallest ones are with the 30, uh, 40 participants. So we, have, we can accommodate very, very large variety of, of events. So uh, I, uh, I will stop here, and uh, we would be very willing to uh, answer any questions you may have, uh, including uh, relation between uh, our event and um, uh, General Assembly event. Yeah, maybe that I will, I will tell. Uh, today we do not know uh, what modalities will be decided in New York uh, on the uh, review, 2015 review. But whatever uh, will be decided, uh, the structure of the conference is organized in a way that can be accommodated easily. And here I'm, I'm speaking, if by any chance uh, in uh, the General Assembly this year it will be decided to uh, engage in negotiations, then uh, we can add one stream of negotiations of whatever uh, review outcome document uh, UNGA would like to see uh, in 2015, and that would be considered as a first PREPCOM uh, in developing this outcome document of, of review by General uh, Assembly. So uh, the, this, the structure of the conference is flexible and we will accommodate whatever decision will be made in New York. I will stop here and we'll open the, the floor for questions uh, related to the VISIS review process and conference in Paris. It's all clear? Or we don't have a microphone. What's the? <laughs> ah, we we have a microphone here. Could. Thank you uh, very much, Bill Graham. I'm on the ICANN board, but speaking for myself, obviously. Uh, this looks like a, an interesting set of events to review the uh, the WISIS ten years later. Uh, and it, it should be uh, very well worthwhile. I understand that the uh, General Assembly will be making decisions about the negotiations uh, that may or may not take place, so we'll, we'll just have to wait for that. Uh, what I'm asking, I think, is what, how, do you, how are you and the ITU and your partner agencies uh, working out the coordination between your event in 2013 and the 2014 event? Thank you. Uh, so uh, what I presented to you has been actually the outcome of uh, long discussions already, preliminary discussions with our partners and their co-organizers. Uh, next week we will open registration and you will find an invitation letter co-signed by uh, Dr. Ture, uh, by the administrator Helen Clark, by our Director General and also Dr. Superchai from UNCTAD. And uh, they have seen the PowerPoint I showed you uh, with, um, with the structure of the event, and we have agreed uh, on that. So we are on weekly teleconferences to discuss different things and to shape uh, this event together. And now, uh, for the differences between the 2013 and the 14 event, um, it, is, uh, it is clear that our two the 2013 event will have a clear forward-looking uh, dimension looking at recent trends, foresight, forecast, recommendations to start being creative. We know that these things are not uh, a one-shot uh, thing, but we will on our, particularly on UNESCO themes, but also on, on other themes, formulate recommendations I mean, uh, and, and bring them forward. So uh, the, 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 the 2014 event by ITU will really, and and you know, you will have noticed perhaps on the, on the slide for the second day, for example, I'm not speaking about action lines. We talk about themes because we want to look at the post-2015 future and we want to also inform and, and influence possibly, you know, what is shaping up with the MDG process, with the post-2015 process, and one needs to do it now. So we try to think a little bit out of the traditional uh, categories uh, like the action lines uh, but you will find these action lines again in 2014 
when there will be the traditional reporting process. So our conference is um, a preparation for post-2015, so is, of course, the 2014 event in ITU where the forward-looking document will be adopted. But we will try to influence and think already early uh, the themes uh, and not do the traditional I mean, action line reporting, which will take place uh, in, in the ITU 2014 event, where UNESCO will be co-organizing too. I mean, the, we will find the same co-organizers uh, for the 2014 event. Uh, and just to add one uh, element uh, to what Cedric said is um, uh, technically and legally uh, this event uh, will be uh, categorized as a category four uh, conference of UNESCO, which means that that is expert conference uh, and experts uh, will uh, work out recommendations for the director general of UNESCO. That is the legal con construct of uh, UNESCO conferences. So these uh, uh, recommendations, Director General of UNESCO, will forward to ITU to feed uh, them uh, in the 2014 event, and they will be also forwarded to uh, UNDESA uh, to, s uh, to feed in whatever review uh, process will be organized uh, at the General Assembly level. So these are, as we have here, uh, feeder workshops to the um, uh, main uh, main discussions. Uh, um, uh, this conference also will be feeding in the um, uh, uh, review process, which will uh, end with the review at 2015 uh, at the General Assembly. So any other questions? please yeah. Yeah, uh, we uh, Paris conference is uh, going to be important event in with this uh, uh, process and uh, I wonder you mentioned that there will be a room and uh, invitation for uh, co-allocated uh, meetings and events and do you see this uh, as an opportunity not only to discuss uh, policy issues but also to showcase uh, uh, major activities and achievements in implementing uh, 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 this is action plan um, ample uh, uh, in uh, European uh, multilingualism is one of the important uh, uh, items in this action plan to ensure uh, language diversity and uh, uh, enable act uh, in uh, uh, in uh, all the languages and in Europe uh, where is uh, 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 interesting development in this field uh, by establishing multilingual Europe technology alliance and uh, uh, we also plan to uh, demonstrate uh, where uh, approach and uh, activities in enabling multilingualism uh, uh, on internet and um, I wonder would it be a possibility to allocate these is, uh, events as part of uh, Paris conference. Thank you. Um, multilingualism will certainly be one of the topic, uh, important topics and there are two different ways I can see that some of the achievements, I mean, one, one would certainly need to discuss the recent developments, including also the, the research which went, uh, which we all invested in, um, uh, which has been published recently also by UNESCO. But um, uh, that is certainly an opportunity on the first day to, to look at what has happened in this domain. Uh, but there's a second opportunity, and that is also um, beside that there will be an, uh, an EFAP roundtable, uh, just for your information. And so inf EFAP is in information for all program of UNESCO, uh, which will have also an entire uh, strand of activities, which include multilingualism. Um, 
that uh, there will be also uh, the possibility of having exhibition booths. Actually, in the next, again, next week, we will open the possibility to register for exhibition booths. So if people have uh, things uh, they would like to particularly showcase, I invite them to ask for an exhibition booth. Uh, we will see how many interests there will be, but we have many opportunities again for, uh, for exhibition booths too. So that would be another way to highlight implementation. There are other questions? Yeah, this is uh, for Wei Wu, it's also the IP4. <coughs> I'd like to ask, uh, uh, is that, you know, because uh, as we know in this uh, conference, a lot of people talking about human rights. Know, and in, in that uh, conference, is, is there any opportunity to have a more chance for the open courses? As you know, the open courses is uh, getting very popular around, around everywhere. And it's very important, particularly for the future education. So is that the open courses can be one of the top thing in this, uh, in the following, uh, you know, the, the conference. Uh, could you could you uh, clarify what you mean by open courses uh, during the conference, or you're talking about um, uh, the open education resources? Uh, uh, open open education, you know, our process and also yeah, the opportunity. Particularly, it's a dispute, and to be known, for, you know, particularly for example, like developing country, because uh, there is a it's a much easy for them to receive the good education. Yeah, um, let me let me answer um, this this question, which ba basically contains two elements. W one is um, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, one one of the key. Uh, uh, st streams uh, in the UNESCO Internet Forum or special event, Internet special event, will be devoted to different aspects of freedom of expression. If you would like to know more about it, I, I believe that Guy can uh, tell you a little bit uh, what what is uh, uh, what we're planning for uh, for that particular um, uh, stream of, of activities. When it comes to open education resources, the term which was developed. Uh, or invented by uh, UNESCO about ten, ten years ago. Uh, this will be uh, very much present uh, in the discussions related to education. And uh, uh, certainly we will be uh, presenting uh, also the recent developments in, uh, in open education resources in, January, sorry, in June this year. Uh, in Paris, we hosted uh, World 2012 World uh, Congress on Open Education Resources. We, uh, and this will be very much present in the uh, uh, in the conference as a, a very uh, strong trend and uh, a, a possibility to uh, save a lot of money uh, for education ministries, which then could be channeled in other uh, pressing needs uh, of uh, education systems around the world. Uh, so, uh, on on both parts of the question, answer is yes. We will be present. Any other questions? Ah, yes, Guy, if you could maybe dwell a little bit on uh, uh, ideas about uh, freedom expression. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, um, UNESCO is the one of the parts of the UN that particularly is mandated in fact, uh, in this constitution to promote uh, freedom of expression. So that is the one right of all the human rights that we are, so it's our special thing. So w in the UNESCO special event in the, in the second day of this, we will be looking at these questions. Uh, we will continue the discussion on how does the right to privacy impact on the right to freedom of expression, which we started here in uh, at the IGF. We will have a special session on the state of freedom of expression in the Arab, sp Arab Spring countries. And then we have some other uh, uh, sessions which are related to what is the media, uh, how is the media responding to the changes uh, in the information society. One is media and, uh, and technology. The other session will be the rise of citizen journalists. Uh, that will be a discussion. 
and then we are looking at two other possible sessions, one on empowering the audience through media and, and information literacy, including uh, the, the, the curricula in the schools to, to teach uh, young people how to engage with the internet. And lastly, uh, the question of community media as part of the media, uh, total media landscape is also probably going to be a session. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So if uh, not, then uh, I hope that um, uh, you will relay this information uh, to uh, everybody who will be interested in, in uh, hearing that. I hope that uh, your organizations will be present uh, in, the, uh, in the business review uh, process and will contribute to it uh, substantively. Uh, and uh, we will put this presentation and also a transcript, uh, maybe slightly edited transcript, uh, to our website and we'll send it around to everybody that people can, uh, uh, those who are interested can uh, learn about it. Um, and next week uh, in Paris we will be uh, uh, making the presentation to UNESCO member states uh, about the, the, uh, the event and um, this is the way how we will inform also uh, the governments. Now let me move uh, to the other part of the uh, conversation and uh, give you uh, a little update on the conference which uh, we um, organized together with the many partners uh, in Vancouver uh, in University of British Columbia uh, related to uh, preservation of digital information. Maybe we I, I need uh, to uh, step back a little bit and start by saying that UNESCO uh, issues uh, related to preservation of digital heritage started uh, address in uh, late uh, last century and uh, early 2000. Uh, these preliminary uh, explorations led to adoption of the charter on preservation of digital heritage by the General Conference in 2003. Uh, one of the uh, provisions of the Charter suggested that in um, six years' time, uh, Secretariat should conduct the, the uh, survey uh, on the results of implementation of the Charter. And uh, uh, UNESCO launched the process in 2009 uh, the process was concluded in 2010 and the results uh, proved uh, that very little has been done uh, in member states uh, to preserve uh, uh, digital heritage. Uh, in parallel, many member states asked us to uh, provide guidance on digitization policies. Uh, which uh, is uh, a very useful process, but at the same time very costly and requires certain uh, guidance uh, how, to, how it that should be organized. Based on the results of the survey, it became evident uh, that UNESCO should uh, put a, a additional effort in uh, explaining to our member states the complexities associated with um, uh, uh, digital preservation uh, and with that in mind, uh, we uh, approached many partners uh, from uh, intergovernmental organizations, uh, uh, WIPO, uh, organization of uh, uh, Francophonie. Uh, we uh, worked uh, with um, uh, private sector companies, uh, Microsoft and Google. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, professional associations and um, uh, international uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, here I would mention um, IFLA, International Federation of Library Associations, International Council of Archives, Internet Society. Uh, we worked with academic institutions, a uh, consortium of uh, Canadian universities, uh, uh, University of British Columbia, University of Toronto, McGill University, um, University of uh, Quebec, 
uh, and other uh, other academic institutions. Uh, we worked with the National Commission of Canada and delegation of Canada Canadian government uh, in order uh, to um, to have this uh, conference, which in my vision uh, put uh, or provided guidance to UNESCO uh, in its further work on preservation of digital uh, heritage and uh, digitization. Uh, a conference, as I mentioned, took place in Vancouver, 26-28 uh, September. It uh, was organized uh, in more or less in a style as we have here, uh, plenary presentations and then parallel workshops. We addressed uh, all issues uh, one can think of related to digital uh, preservation and digitization. Uh, they included technical issues, uh, they included uh, uh, legal issues, organizational issues, uh, they included um, educational issues. Uh, the uh, conference was attended uh, by uh, 500 experts from 110 countries. Uh, and resulted with the um, uh, Vancouver conference, uh, Vancouver Declaration, which can be found um, on the uh, website uh, of the conference, uh, which is uh, at on, on the UNESCO website. Uh, I most probably I will not uh, walk you through the uh, the declaration itself. I will maybe uh, tell what are the major outcomes. Uh, for UNESCO and where we would uh, like to see uh, uh, cooperation uh, with, um, uh, with other interested stakeholder groups. Let me uh, start by saying that when I went to the conference, I, I knew that this is a fairly complicated uh, subject area. But when I listened to the conference, the presentations and the expert views, I understood that this is uh, something close to impossible. Uh, and, and indeed, when, when you think, uh, just a very simple example, when, when you think about a book, a printed book, and it doesn't matter whether the book was printed uh, a week ago or it was handwritten on the lambskin seven, eight centuries ago, the only obstacle between the reader and the information contained in the book is a script and the language. When you take an electronic book, you have uh, a device, you have an operating system, you have a software, and then you have a script and language. In other words, it, it, is, it, it becomes as a little bit as a Swiss watch with the three additional complications on top of one we know since uh, uh, creation of the of the books. Uh, secondly, uh, our understanding uh, about uh, how we should preserve and what should be done to preserve uh, certainly lags behind the uh, technological developments. The moment we think we have found a solution, technology is uh, has advanced f uh, uh, further and uh, our solutions are not really applicable anymore. Uh, we need, we need uh, much uh, further, uh, let's say, in-depth thinking uh, what, uh, what we want to preserve and how we should do that. And actually also who should pay for it because uh, the, let's say, the, the uh, perception of uh, general public is that you know I, I put my information on USB stick and that's it uh, no f no further costs involved and that that is preserved for the next generations and maybe even for 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 next three generations and of course that perception is completely wrong uh, everything what we know today is how to preserve digital information for maybe 10 years uh, and actually we do not know uh, how to uh, treat that, uh, what we're preserving now, actually we're storing now, and not that much uh, we're preserving. Uh, we need to start by developing uh, the overall uh, system. We need to train uh, professionals 
uh, we need to create all necessary attributes which will allow us uh, to uh, search uh, and to find information. And here I would like to uh, quote Ben Sof, who was uh, making a, a keynote presentation at the conference uh, where uh, he said, you know, from a technical point of view to, uh, to physically preserve a bit of information for 100 years, maybe it's not a really big deal. But the big deal is to make sense out of that information after 100 years. And uh, so the, the uh, system uh, of uh, megadata uh, which uh, uh, need to be associated with, with every electronic uh, document uh, or el every el uh, electronic um, uh, object is something that uh, uh, also we need to, um, to think about. And actually, uh, very few people, when they create electronic uh, objects, uh, they automatically think about um, a metadata set to attach to, to, to it. Uh, so, then um, we uh, uh, we were discussing uh, the role of um, uh, industry in long-term uh, preservation and long-term accessibility to information. Uh, I see that uh, industry should have a very particular role in assuring that uh, the information which is uh, born digital uh, should be accessible uh, in, in the future and to, to ensure long-term accessibility. What I mean by that, uh, technology is changing every five years and the uh, backward compatibility issue is a big, um, a big question. Of course, that require additional um, uh, investment from the industry, but I, I think that industry should be uh, involved also uh, as a and should have certain responsibility in uh, making sure that investments which are uh, done by public uh, organizations, by governments, by individuals uh, should, uh, uh, should be preserved and that we should not reinvest uh, all the time in recovery uh, the um, electronic information uh, when the uh, format uh, becomes obsolete. Uh, in other words, uh, the conference uh, called on industry to make sure that uh, in, the, in their technological development they um, uh, uh, try to take care of backward compatibility uh, and accessibility to information. Uh, we uh, talked about um, uh, intellectual property associated with pre preservation of information and uh, certainly that also is a very complex issue which uh, will be dealt in the future in, um, uh, in WIPO. Uh, and finally, uh, we, we were uh, also, uh, we developed uh, in the run up to the conference uh, the database uh, who is who in uh, in the field of digitization and digital preservation. Uh, that database was presented at the conference. We are fine-tuning uh, it uh, these, these days and uh, it will be uh, put online live and we hope that that also will contribute to the better uh, understanding who does what and uh, who might be helpful in what sense uh, when, when one plans to do uh, preservation uh, of digital heritage. The uh, conference also discussed the um, guidelines for uh, digitization and these guidelines uh, will be uh, presented to the member states of UNESCO at, at their request uh, in one of the uh, future uh, sessions of executive board. And um, uh, we also uh, launched or uh, the, the conference uh, suggested to Director General that UNESCO should launch an emergency digitization program. Uh, which would allow uh, a recover the uh, uh, documents uh, which might be lost as a result of um, a natural disaster uh, or uh, social upheaval uh, by dispatching uh, mobile uh, digitization devices in these uh, areas of disaster 
and making uh, or saving uh, what could be saved in terms of uh, images of documents, at least uh, in uh, preserving uh, pre preserving them. So these these are uh, these were major uh, sort of uh, or, or points which I wan wanted to make about the conference. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, for UNESCO, that is the big, uh, that is a, a start of the major effort on uh, preservation of digital heritage. Uh, we uh, would like to uh, invite all interested stakeholder groups uh, to use UNESCO as a platform uh, for uh, getting together and addressing whatever issues need to be addressed, because today uh, we uh, we see that there is not a, uh, a kind of federating platform where different initiatives could be uh, discussed and, and uh, issues could be addressed. These issues relate to standardization of uh, processes related to digitization and digital preservation. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, relates to um, uh, exchange of uh, best practices or, or uh, thinking about uh, the system of uh, preservation, long-term preservation. And uh, I hope that UNESCO uh, may become that type of platform. In other words, for, for, for the audience, uh, maybe what you know better, that UNESCO with time uh, may become uh, what ISOC today is for IETF. UNESCO with time may become uh, for digital uh, digital preservation community uh, provide a platform, uh, provide a service uh, of um, uh, for, for them to, to come together and work uh, on uh, all related subjects. So I will stop here and would be happy to answer any questions you may have either on uh, our approach to digital preservation or digitization or to um, outcomes of Vancouver Conference. I see none. So then the final uh, topic which we w would like to address and, and uh, uh, present, though I think that I have run out of copies. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are working also on issues uh, related to uh, multilingualism on the, on the internet. Uh, again, in 2003, and all that was done in, in the context of preparation for the first uh, phase of um, this is for Geneva summit. Uh, UNESCO uh, adopted uh, recommendations on um, uh, multilingualism in cyberspace. In uh, in UNESCO terms, recommendations mean uh, means uh, legally binding document for member states, and member states are uh, reporting on a regular basis uh, what uh, uh, they have been undertaking in uh, promoting multilism multilingualism in cyberspace. And we're monitoring and, and uh, sharing best practices uh, on the basis of uh, Director General's report on, on this subject. Uh, if we look to, uh, to the internet and compare uh, at what level multilingualism was 10 years ago and where it is now, I think we, we, we can uh, say that there has been considerable progress in terms of uh, volume uh, of uh, multilingual in information uh, on, the, on the internet. Uh, English was dominating language. Uh, today, most probably, we cannot say any longer that English is dominating language on, on, the, uh, on the internet. Uh, I think very soon, uh, though English still is number one in terms of use, uh, but um, uh, Chinese is catching up very quickly. And I will not be surprised then if uh, one year or two years from now, Chinese will be the, the biggest uh, language on, on the internet. Uh, but also other languages like uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Portuguese, Russian, Arabic, uh, certain uh, Hindi uh, certainly are well well present uh, on the uh, on the internet, and then of course uh, 150 
uh, other languages represent about, if I'm not, I'm not mistaken, uh, statistically 10% uh, of, of, the, of the remaining. So this is a positive trend. Nevertheless, uh, we, still, uh, we still can do more in promoting uh, multilingualism. And we see there are two um, avenues for doing this. One avenue is uh, promoting, uh, promoting uh, a creation of uh, local content in local languages and stimulating this uh, content creation. Uh, and second is uh, to uh, work together with technical organizations like ICANN in um, facilitating uh, implementation of uh, IDN CCTLDs and in the future also IDN GTLDs uh, in the route uh, with the hope that that will also stimulate uh, um, more use of internet and actually uh, I would uh, argue that uh, for new GTLDs and uh, CCTLDs, we're working more on those who do not master ASCII or, or Latin script rather than those who are already um, uh, on, on the internet. Uh, the target audience, in my view, uh, for uh, IDN.IDN uh, domains are those who do not master Latin script at all. So let me go uh, uh, back to the first string. Um, uh, local local content as a driver for the multilingualism. We, um, when when you go to somebody and says, you know, this is a good idea. Would you would you like to help me? A uh, person said, uh, you know, I I am busy. It's not my priority, and and it does not necessarily work uh, work all the time. Uh, just encouragement. You need to find the the stimulus uh, how to do it. And uh, we we looked last year uh, to this issue of. Um, uh, local content creation from economic angle and we uh, launch a study to see whether there is any correlation between the volume of local content which is kept on local internet infrastructure and the and the price what local internet users are um, uh, paying for access locally uh, by launching this study we did it two assumptions uh, we made it ma we made two assumptions one that the um, majority of consumption would be a local content and I think that this is a fairly uh, a credible assumption uh, think about the pattern of uh, use of internet what you do you first you look your uh, local sites in local language and then maybe you go to international sites and the second assumption which was made which also in my view is fairly accurate was that the local uh, traffic, internet traffic is always cheaper than international. So based on these two assumptions, uh, OECD did a uh, fairly elaborate uh, uh, econometric uh, analysis and, and uh, came to conclusion that there is a positive correlation. More you have a, a, a local content volume kept on local internet infrastructure, provided that there is ISP in the country, uh, cheaper it gets uh, uh, for internet users to use the, uh, the this, this consu consume this content, uh, this allows us this allowed us to make a policy statement for governments. Please uh, invest in local content uh, production, because also you invest in jobs, and please invest in uh, local internet infrastructure, because you in parallel you invest also in the knowledge. Uh, this study was published and is publicly available on OECD website and also on, on UNESCO website. And uh, we will be uh, using this uh, study and we're, we're planning to uh, continue working on it uh, to expand and, and uh, uh, see uh, other economic correlations. Because now we have a very good argument. This is economically viable to invest in local content production in local language and uh, we, uh, UNESCO will be uh, promoting this um, with the government. Uh, with the um, IDNs, uh, again, to, uh, together with URID, we, we're partnering in analyzing the um, uptake of IDN CCTLDs, uh, which uh, introduction of which started in 2009. As you know, the first uh, IDN's IDN IDN was uh, allocated for Russia, .rf, uh, for Egypt, 
today we have uh, today we have about 30 uh, IDN uh, CCTLD uh, domains. Uh, some of them are very successful. Uh, some of them are struggling to uh, launch operations. And uh, the aim of the study was to analyze what are the uh, circumstances or what are factors which uh, affect the uptake of IDNs in countries. Uh, we did a study, uh, we looked particularly in Russia, we looked particularly in Korea, uh, we looked particularly in some Arab uh, countries and uh, not keeping your attention um, uh, too long, uh, the study is available uh, on URID website, on UNESCO website, and also we, we, we had it um, uh, at our booth. Uh, there were two areas uh, of um, which we have identified as, as uh, uh, problem areas. One was technical and one was organizational. Organizational was very simple. The country uh, did not have sufficient uh, infrastructure to promote IDNs uh, for um, for adoption for registration. Uh, very f very few uh, local uh, uh, domain registries. Uh, very little information about advantages, and so on. Um, limitations or, or uh, restrictive registration policies in the countries. Uh, these are issues which uh, certainly we will be uh, addressing with member states, advising them to uh, take away or to liberalize registration policies, to uh, pay attention uh, to um, uh, outreach and so on. And then another cluster is technical issues. Uh, where, uh, of course, governments can do much, but that is a technical community which needs to put uh, uh, heads around these issues. Uh, we identified uh, that s uh, browsers, not all browsers, support IDNs. We identified that um, the email protocol in IDNs or supporting IDNs would facilitate the uptake uh, uh, because in IDN.IDN uh, domains, uh, users for the moment cannot receive the same level of uh, services as they receive in even in IDN.ASCII uh, domain. Uh, and the third uh, would be uh, IDN uh, capability of major uh, social portals. Uh, which are popular portals, uh, which are used by, by uh, many people around the world. Uh, and certainly here we will be reaching out technical community, uh, 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 drawing their attention to these, to these issues. Uh, again, we are inviting all those who are interested to partner with us. Uh, and uh, I will stop here uh, and we'll try to answer the, your questions if, if you have any. Uh, and then we can, uh, after that, we can talk about anything else you may, you may be interested. So I will start with the gentleman and then Khalid you. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Jose. I'm from Mexico. Uh, it's about the first point about the heritage, the storage. Um, I'm working creating math lessons on YouTube. So for me, it's a worry because right now I have uh, more than 1,200 videos about math. So my worry is how can I keep all these materials maybe in the future? Because as you said, uh, the storage, I don't know, the memories, they will maybe erase or disappear in I don't know how many years. So uh, from, from your point of view, what can you recommend me to keep all these materials uh, because, for example, right now, all these materials is starting in, in, to upload in internet. But in my city, we spoke with the government to, to pass all the materials from internet to TV. So we are broadcasting right now. In the future, uh, we don't know. Maybe these materials we can uh, transfer broadcasting in different medias. So that's why I'm worried right now to keep all these materials 
and I, I don't want that they disappear. I, I think I think that you you have all the reasons to be worried because they may disappear if you will not take care of them yourself for the moment. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not a, a guru in, in this. Uh, I, I think that individuals should uh, just to make sure that uh, they they keep uh, this information on the carriers, uh, which. Uh, can be accessed by existing technology and that you transfer uh, to every new uh, format which will be invented uh, uh, in let's say in the time in the reasonable time not uh, letting uh, the format which you are using in your your videos uh, to become obsolete and not be transferable to any any new next format so uh, but of course, that is not not a, not a really solution. The solution should be found um, in a systemic way, and this is where where UNESCO uh, is willing to support a community to uh, to work on these solutions, and uh, also uh, support national governments uh, with the sharing information, best practice in the existing practices in other in other parts of the world, uh, where uh, some kind of solutions already are found. Uh, and uh, help them to, to introduce these solutions uh, uh, where they, they are needed. I, I think that I cannot go beyond that. Uh, this is a very specific uh, question, but um, I will repeat, uh, you are absolutely right being worried about the your videos and, and their long-term preservation. Khaled? On, on the you would like to speak on uh, IDNs or on uh, preservation? IDN, okay, then after Khaled. Um, thank you, Yanis. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Khaled Fatal. I'm um, a group chairman of the Multilingual Internet Group. Uh, Yanis and I have known each other for many years from the days when he was uh, chairman of the GAC. And actually, I found myself listening to your presentation, covering a lot of issues and, uh, and nodding uh, positively by um, uh, to the issues that you're addressing at UNESCO, and I think this is very, very positive. Um, there are many issues that came to mind, and do forgive me, I did not take note that cover them all, but uh, if they come up, I'll, I'll mention them again. Um, one of the things that I think may be of value to keep in mind is what and how to prioritize so that the objectives that we fully agree with uh, um, are met. For example, the issue of um, uh, content and the driving of content uh, and localization um, uh, for, uh, towards the achieving the goal of multilingualism. I have seen in the space of the last decade and a half that I've been pushing for the global multilingual, multi multilingual internet and IDNs, um, many efforts, especially by governments in local uh, communities, uh, trying to promote this which have actually not reached the desired target. And there's a challenge with that. Now, some of it has have actually uh, been solutions in the last few years that worked, and primarily for the following reasons. For the last five, six years, we've seen a new uh, a change in technology going towards apps. So a lot of people have started using apps to deploying the local content overriding the need of having a URL in the local community language, Arabic, Russian, etc. And this is probably what has actually fostered a lot of the uptake of the um, new localized content on the internet. So going back to the previous, let's say, the f uh, 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 earlier than five or six years, the challenge was that you needed to have singularly or predominantly you needed to have the URL uh, in the local language to be able to do this, and that was a huge obstacle, and this is why we have uh, very few, uh, very little content in the local language except uh, speeches of, uh, especially now, deposed presidents that lasted for hours and nobody wanted to read that stuff. And then we go into the issue of the economies. You know, if you have content, um, what's the economy behind it that will drive somebody to go to it that will have a economic value, whether you can build advertising around it or somebody will pay for it. So my, my 
point that I would raise is in trying to advance local content, it is not enough, based on the experience we've seen in the last decade and a half, it's not enough to actually call on governments to advance this. It's actually uh, uh, making sure that all elements that are re uh, requirements for this content to be deployed and helping the local community citizens, as you described earlier on, and we fully agree, is uh, uh, to be able to go and create content and deploy it online um, uh, as, as easily as possible. Browser issues. So it, it really becomes a question of prioritization. Um, and I think the, the ability of having URLs in the local language will expand the content exponentially um, which is why we're still seeing only minor increases in content, not significantly enough. Thank you. You, you saw me also nod nodding when you were. You saw me also nodding when you were speaking. So we are in agreement. Uh, this is Shalong Lee, the vice president for ICANN uh, for Asia. So I, I'm very happy you mentioned the ID and also the internationalized email address. So, but from my po point of view, you know, for the internationalized domain name from the be very beginning in uh, 1999 and, and 2000, it uh, began to make the standard. But uh, the first ID and uh, TRD was enabled in the research in 2010. So it cost almost 10 years to, to make a standard and implement it in the software. So I just wonder if the internationalized email address we will be having the same story. Uh, also need to take 10 years, you know, uh, uh, but I, I never saw the, the speci specific topic for, for the internationalized email address, but I'm happy you mentioned that, but I, I don't know uh, what's the community and especially for UNESCO to, to do something for, for this. I mean, I mean to promote the, the, the vendors or some government to support to 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 deploy the the internationalized email address, you know, the email application is the second largest application, except for the website. So it's very very important for people to use that. I, if they, they cannot use the email address for the internationalized email address, so it, it's not better for the internet inter internationalized domain name, because it, they cannot communicate with email. So it's very very important. But I don't know, it, Yanis, yeah, how UNESCO to do something to deploy the, the adding also the internet like email e address. You know, also, by the way, you know, the even for the IDN, it uh, cannot be used globally. Now there's so many software, except for them, some very, very important browser, they cannot support the IDN very much. You know, it, in some sense, they don't think that it's a top level domain. So that is a lot of problem. They need a lot of, lot of collaboration and need, need, need a lot of resource to do that. Thank you. I, I am uh, fully in agreement with you. It's not a trivial issue. Uh, in the workshop uh, where we launched this report, Vint uh, explained the, the complexities associated with uh, uh, these technical issues. Uh, nevertheless, uh, my argument is we have invested so much money and, and when we, I mean all of us, community, uh, in developing uh, IDNs uh, and we, I, I would argue that we have built a house and all we need to do now is to put the roof. And uh, uh, certainly we are not among uh, the builders but we can um, advocate for putting that roof on and uh, making appeal to uh, technical community to work towards uh, developing these missing uh, pieces of uh, protocols or, or uh, software, uh, which then uh, allow potentially allow uh, the uh, uptake of um, uh, use of uh, IDNs in uh, on the on the web and, and uh, uh, internet. So, Andres. Hello, uh, my name is Andres Vasilios, I'm from Latvia, and uh, I would like to add some complexity to today's discussion on multilingualism and to draw your attention to the recent study made by uh, previously mentioned uh, uh, Multilingual European Technology Alliance uh, studying situation of European languages 
their preparedness for the digital age and more than 200 experts participated in this study and the results are published uh, in 30 white papers published in 30 books by Springer and uh, uh, conclusions are uh, quite uh, strongly worded and dramatic because experts believe that even in Europe the situation uh, is uh, much better than in many other parts of the world. Uh, 21 language, uh, national language of some European country is uh, in a long-term danger, is not sufficiently prepared for the digital age. And uh, this is not an Im immediate danger, but if we long, uh, look in the longer term, then uh, uh, languages should be uh, supported by more than once the technologies. Uh, it's not just about content, it's also content is uh, very much related to the tools and techniques to deal with this content, to analyze content, to support people to access information in foreign language. For example, machine translation, because uh, content will, uh, whatever activities we will do, still the content in uh, major languages will dominate. These are about 15 languages on this planet there are thousands of other languages and so we have to develop uh, technologies like machine translations uh, to uh, uh, enable people to access foreign language content and also speech technologies where uh, this uh, interface, how we deal with uh, technology, with uh, devices is changing from text-based to speech-based and in speech area uh, only a few languages benefit from sufficient technological support. And uh, uh, we study uh, calls for governments to pay attention and to be aware about these consequences and to have a targeted action in this area. And I think this is uh, uh, an aspect what should be also included in the mm, discussions and debate uh, under UNESCO umbrella uh, about multilingualism on internet. Thank you. So thank, thank you, Anders. Um, y you're right, actually, the two technologies you mentioned, I recall we had uh, Steve Crocker uh, last year at UNESCO. He was giving a keynote presentation and answering questions, what are three uh, uh, big things which are coming? He said uh, that networks will sink in, uh, machine translation, and voice recognition technologies. So you you mentioned two. These are two big things coming. Though that raises some some other questions <laughs> when we when we think think what what humans will become uh, when these technologies will be fine tuned, because today uh, many teachers are complaining that kids are not uh, are losing their ability of handwriting because they are typing. But then imagine the voice recognition, keyboards will disappear. <laughs> Shall I continue? <laughs> so, uh, Khaled, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yanis. I, uh, again, as I said, I don't want to monopolize the microphone, but um, a couple of things I wanted to raise uh, pertaining to the last two uh, gentlemen who uh, interjected a moment ago. Um, the gentleman from Latvia made some excellent remarks, but I also want to point to the previous gentleman who's now typing on his computer. If you can hear me, turn to your left, please, sir. No, he's not listening to me. That's all right. Um, it's, it's key to acknowledge some of the key fundamentals as to why we are so behind when it comes to multilingualism and to, um, uh, to IDNs. Um, I do not put it on the shoulders of UNESCO. I think UNESCO can, ha can be an excellent instrument in promoting what needs to be done so that at least we get to the promised land. Point number one, um, we all know that ICANN has received 1,900 plus applications from UGKLDs. Those of us who have been involved in the WISIS, the early days, will recognize that the whole drive to do UGKLDs uh, since 2005 
was to, uh, to help ICANN internationalize itself, which actually was part of the reason why IGF was born as well. As a result, we ended up in a space of a few years to try to launch IDNs and serve those emerging markets. But as a result as well, we ended up with 1,900 applications, only 5% are on IDNs. And if you look at the percentages of those IDN replications, there's some significant numbers are coming from Western companies applying for Chinese, for example. So that's really not advancing the cause of multi as you and I would understand, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, under, uh, accept that. At the heart of this issue is the fact that IDNs and serving the multilingual community and local uh, 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 languages and, and citizens of those communities was not at the heart of the ethos of the deployment. This is why we're ending up with more than 1800s are mostly in, in, in the English alphabet. This, I think, needs to change. We're talking about infrastructurally. This needs to change, and I think UNESCO, and we're doing our part as well, for, uh, UNESCO can have a significant role in making sure that the next phase or the next era of ICANN actually does not blink and does not divert its attention of what needs to happen, which is serving the global public interest. Thank you. So thank you, Khaled, for this uh, proposal. I, I, I think nothing prevents us from raising these issues. And, and um, again, we uh, here we are talking more about uh, UNESCO rather than ICANN, I would, I would say. But yeah, I think that the work with UNESCO is doing and multilingualism leads towards that uh, conclusion or that direction that you're pointing. So any other questions? Please, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Yaoi. Just a clarification. Uh, during your presentation, you talk about uh, uh, IDN domain 30. Uh, that is not clear for me. Is it something dot IDN or you have some? This, that's not clear for me. Yeah, I was I was referring to um, current level of deployment of IDN CCTLDs, which stands around 30. Uh, do you know the ICANN IDN CCTLD program? Yeah, so the, the, the number today is around 30 and growing. Okay, I see no further requests for the floor. We are reaching the end of uh, uh, UNESCO Open Forum. If you have any, any questions not related to any topics we have uh, uh, spoken before, it's a chance to ask them now. I see no burning desire. So then, uh, thank you very much for uh, honoring us with your presence. And the uh, uh, session stands adjourned, and we will uh, repeat this session in uh, 2013. Thank you.